And uh, the next speaker is uh, going to be uh, Matt Kunzer, who is a postdoc at the Alan Turing Institute. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Miguel. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Matt, and uh, uh, this is joint work with Gao, Chuan, Yu, Killian uh, at Cornell, and Fei Sha at USC. And uh, I have the opportunity to also go right before a break. Um, and so, uh, similar to what Sebastian did, I'm going to sort of try to get you guys engaged, um, but I'm going to do it in a very different way. I'm going to start by quizzing you. Uh, and the quiz question, the first one is, uh, are these texts similar? The first one says, I just cooked this awesome recipe. It is my favorite dish. The food is so yummy. The second one says, my favorite politician gave an awesome speech about an important topic. Well, of course, in, in one sense, these are very similar. They both express a positive sentiment. Uh, and these words help us identify this. In another sense, they're very different. The first is about food, the second is about politics. The second quiz question. Which of these books is most similar? Uh, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, The Wizard of Oz, and The Cuckoo's Calling? Well, if by similarity you mean that similar books should be those that have similar themes and similar genres, then the first two books should be more similar, because uh, these are fantasy novels versus adult, an adult detective novel. But if by similar you mean that the authorship of the books are the same, well then the first and the third book should be more similar than the first and the second. So the way usually people go about constructing a similarity metric between uh, two texts is they first begin by constructing a vector for each document. And then they go and compute some similarity metric, uh, uh, like the Euclidean distance, uh, as a measure of uh, dissimilarity between these texts. So what I'm showing you right now are six different ways to represent documents as vectors. And I'm reporting on the y-axis the error of each of these methods when you use them for k-nearest neighbor classification. And the error is with respect to the bag of words error. So uh, we, use, we represent each document as a vector, and then we classify based on their similarity using these vectors. Importantly, the lower the better. The, you have better encoded similarity because your error is lower. I'm going to compare also against um, some classic methods like uh, latent Dirichlet allocation uh, and latent semantic indexing, uh, as well as a new method called marginalized stack to noise and autoencoders, um, or MSDA. So what we can do uh, if instead we have label information. So we have, for instance, that the first document is written by a certain author and the second document is written by uh, a different one, is we can learn a better similarity than just computing these vectors. Uh, we can transform this vector space with a metric matrix A to uh, learn a similarity such that documents with the same label are close, and documents with different labels are, are, are very dissimilar, or, or sort of distant. Um, and this is the field of linear metric learning. It's a, it's a huge field. Um, and what I'm going to do is show you sort of what it looks like with respect to our problem. So here again is the plot I just showed you. And let's run metric learning on each of these representations and see what happens. So the first thing I'm going to run is information theoretic metric learning by Davis et al. And what we see is that the errors of each of these representations is reduced because we're sort of better capturing this similarity. Um, so what if I just run a different metric learning algorithm and I'll run now large margin nearest neighbors uh, by Weinberger et al. And we again see sort of this error reduction as, as we encode similarity well. And for the heck of it, let's just run neighborhood component analysis, uh, or NCA by Goldberger et al. And uh, we again see an improved result with respect to the unsupervised distance. So what I can do for each of these methods is I can just show the best uh, out of all of the metric learning and unsupervised methods. And we see what we've done is we've reduced the error over the bag of words error by about 60% um, with this specific combination of TFIDF and NCA. Um, now, what if I told you that there's a completely unsupervised way to 
compute the similarity between two documents that nearly matches the state of the art. Well, if you have labels uh, about how documents should be similar, what you'd want to do is you'd want to see if you could learn a better similarity that uh, is encoded by these labels. Uh, so this method is the word movers distance, and it's a technique that we introduced in ICML 2015, and I'm going to show you how it works. The word movers distance is built off word embeddings, and word embeddings are simply mappings from words to a vector space. So now each word is represented by a q-dimensional vector. Importantly, this embedding is learned so that similar words are embedded close together. So the words moon and Saturn are, are for instance, very close in this embedding. So given this embedding, what we can do is we can uh, take a document, for instance, this is a recipe about roasted chicken, and we can uh, first, on the left, compute the normalized bag of words representation of the document. This is just the normalized counts of uh, each word in, uh, in this document. And then we can also take the word embeddings of each of these words. And with this, we can sort of imagine placing these histogram bins at the location of the word embeddings for each word. And I'll call this sort of a new representation, and the term I'll use for it is a bag of word, rep, uh, bag of word vectors. Because um, it's similar to a bag of words, but now we have a vector representing each word. Uh, and then we can take another document about uh, baked kale, and we can also construct the bag of words vector representation. Um, given this new representation, I'm going to propose a distance that I call the word movers distance, or the WMD, which is the minimum cost that's required to transport D to D prime. And by cost, I mean word cost, the minimum amount of word distance I have to move to move the document D to D prime. So to give you an intuition of why this sort of makes sense, I'm going to show what it looks like on this example. So we can imagine trying to fill the histogram bins of D prime with the histogram bins of D. And the cheapest way to do that, the minimum cost, looks like this. So the intuition is we're basically going to try to move as much mass as we can to nearby words, the closest words. And if there's any words that haven't been filled, we're going to move any remaining mass to those words. Um, the reason sort of minimum cost makes sense is because for documents like these that are very similar, this transport, which is shown in, in these gray arrows, is very small, which intuitively makes sense because the word embeddings are close. For two very different documents, when I replace the second document about uh, rebels overthrowing a dictator, um, the transport between these two documents ends up being much larger because we have to traverse much farther in word space. This, uh, this problem, this distance, can be phrased as an optimal transport problem, uh, which can be uh, expressed as a linear program. And the goal is to learn a so-called transport plan or tra transport matrix T, um, such that each entry in this matrix, ij, tells me how much mass I'm moving from bin i in the first document to bin j in the second document. I'd like to learn this transport such that the distance between the word embeddings in the first document and the second is minimized. Subject to the constraint that I pull out all of the document mass from the first document and push it into the second. Uh, and so this is a problem that uh, was maybe first popularized by Rubner in 98, and it was called the earth mover distance. So this is sort of why we call this the word mover distance. And it's in general an even older problem. And there's a nice book by Cedric Villani about optimal transport, which describes this in much more detail and gives nice background on this. Now, when we look at the word mover distance and we think, well, what we'd really like to do is learn this distance based on information that we have about how documents should be similar. We sort of run into a, a roadblock because now we don't have vectors for each document. We have this bag of word vectors representation. So we can't just apply metric learning techniques and learn a better similarity metric. So instead what we're going to do is we're going to incorporate, uh, we're going to try to learn supervision in two ways. The first way is by in 
introducing a metric matrix A, not in document space, but in word space, right here. Intuitively, what this is going to do is it's going to take our original word space, uh, where semantically similar words were close, which could make sense. But if we're interested in distinguishing recipes that are vegan versus non-vegan, well then maybe we'd like words that are non-vegan to be close to each other and words that are vegan to be uh, close to each other and otherwise far apart. And so this A matrix is going to basically learn uh, how to do this. The second way we'll uh, supervise this distance is by introducing uh, what we like to call word importance weights, which element-wise multiply these uh, histogram uh, weights, <laughs> D and D prime. And to make sure we, uh, again, have a distribution, we'll divide by the inner product. Intuitively, what this will do is it'll upweight words that are important for classification and downweight words that aren't. Uh, like chicken is important for identifying that a recipe is non vegan. We'll call this method the supervised word movers distance. Now, sort of the remaining question of the talk is how to learn this distance. Uh, and what we thought originally was, why not just take the, one of the metric learning techniques I showed you, NCA, and plug in the supervised word movers distance in place of the Euclidean distance? Um, uh, and then why not, uh, sorry, and then why not solve this with gradient descent? The immediate problem we run into is solving this optimal transport problem is cubic in the number of unique words in, in a document. Um, uh, and so if we think about trying to uh, update A and W with gradient descent, we sort of start to despair because we have to compute this optimal transport problem every gradient step. So because, uh, because it would be really terrible to end the talk here, um, the, uh, we'll solve this by uh, reworking the uh, optimal transport problem to enable a nice speed up trick um, based on some recent work. Here's how it works. So to give you a better sense of what's going on, this is sort of a nested optimization problem uh, where we're, the outer optimization problem is over the supervised variables A and W and the inner one is over the optimal transport T. So the first change we're going to make is we're going to add the negative entropy of that transport matrix to the objective of the, the word move resistance. And what uh, Couturi showed, and uh, also in Couturi and Doucet, was that you can solve this optimal transport problem in time quadratic uh, instead of cubic. Um, so it, increasing this in order of magnitude. And, and this is a dramatic speed up when we're talking about documents um, that may be very large. Um, so this seems really nice, but if we look again and we stare at our optimization problem, uh, we realize that some of our uh, variables are in the constraints. And we're really hoping to solve this with the gradient-based optimization. So what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll form the dual optimization problem. Because it, it, the nice thing about this problem is it's uh, strongly convex. So we can form the dual and instead solve for the dual variables alpha and beta instead of the transport matrix uh, T. Um, and now all of our variables are in the objective. This is an unconstrained optimization problem. And so the al algorithm follows very nicely. Um, uh, and importantly, this is still quadratic in, uh, in the number of unique words. What we'll do to solve for A and W is just initialize it in some way. We'll then solve for the inner optimization uh, alpha and beta, the optimal transport, <laughs> will then take the gradient of the supervised word move assistance with respect to A and W at this optimal, a and alpha and beta, and then update A and W with this gradient, and sort of repeat until we're satisfied. Okay, so the question on all your minds is, was it re really worth going through all of that to, uh, to uh, describe uh, a method? Um, and so we, again, computed this distance on these, across these eight data sets. And what we found is we were able to improve upon the state of the art. And what I'd like to stress is that what I'm actually showing in these six bars to the left are 24 baselines. Um, so these are three different metric learning techniques and, and unsupervised uh, methods. And we're able to, on average, improve upon them. And sort of more specifically, on seven out of the eight data sets, we can improve. 
uh, we can drop the error over the word movie resistance relatively by larger than 10% on average. And even on one data set, on the Twitter data set, we can drop it by half. We can also visualize what, the, what this algorithm, uh, what each of the distances looks like. Um, and uh, the word, uh, the nice thing about the supervised word move resistance is it sort of much more tightly clusters different classes uh, than the word move resistance. We can also look at the word importance weights. And for example, Reuters is a nice uh, classic uh, news categorization data set. Words like oil and trade are very much um, very important for distinguishing a news document about economics versus one about sports. So it's, so it's upweighted. So to wrap up, I wanted to point out sort of at the beginning of the talk that similarity is an inherently ambiguous concept. So to address this, we introduced the supervised word move resistance. Um, and we supervised it by introducing a metric in word space A and some word importance weights W. Uh, and what we showed is we were able to outperform uh, 25 different benchmark methods on average across eight text classification data sets. And even more practically, we were able to make it fast uh, via this nice trick by Couture and Doucet to make it a quadratic optimization problem. So I'd like to thank my co-authors, um, and uh, I'd like to thank you for listening. If you have any questions. We have time for a few questions. We can also go to lunch too. Then we should go. <laughs> we should go for lunch. <laughs> Thanks. We start like at two o'clock.